Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're now ready to start. Thank you, everybody. This is an amazing crowd. Um, I'm uh, Kerry Dunn, the president of the New York City Bar Association, and I want to welcome you all uh, for coming tonight. Um, and this will be, I predict, a very memorable evening, as it always is. It's no surprise that this event was sold out two weeks ago, uh, which may be uh, a record uh, in, in our organization. Uh, I apologize that the seating is much tighter than it usually is here, uh, but uh, given the size of the demand, we wanted to make sure that as many people as possible were um, able to attend. Um, before going any further, I want to thank tonight's distinguished a lecturer, Judge uh, Nancy Gertner, who you'll hear from in a minute, um, it will be a, a, a very interesting opportunity to hear her views on uh, very contemporary issues. Um, just so you know, the City Bar, for those of you who don't know, established this lecture uh, in Justice Ginsburg's name uh, to celebrate her many contributions to the advancement of women's rights and her achievements as a lawyer, a law professor, and a judge. Uh, we again thank her for allowing us to do this in her name. Um, and as many of you know, we think of Judge Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg as one of our own here at the City Bar because while she was back in New York, back in the day, she was a very active member of the City Bar, including at one point being a member of our uh, executive committee. Um, and it's remarkable, I think, that tonight will mark the 11th Ginsburg lecture in this very hall. So we're all very pleased about that. Um, over the decades, as I'm sure most or all of you know, the City Bar has worked hard uh, to eliminate uh, gender bias as much as we can in our laws, our courts, and our profession. Um, in those efforts, we of course have built always on the foundation created by pioneers such as Justice Ginsburg uh, over the many years. And we recognize that without her contributions to the advancement of women's rights, our society would not be where it is today. Um, this evening, in addition to the lecture, which uh, we're looking forward to, um, I think you know that we have the great privilege of giving the Association Medal, which is rarely bestowed, uh, to Justice Ginsburg. The City Bar's Executive Committee, uh, as, as the process requires, unanimously voted recently to award the medal to Justice Ginsburg upon the recommendation of the Association's Committee on Honors. Uh, which is chaired by Judge Sidney Stein of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Uh, with that, my job is done, and I na it's now my honor to invite uh, Judge Stein up to the podium to present the Association Medal to Justice Ginsburg. The Association Medal is the City Bar's highest honor. As you heard, it is awarded only from time to time. Merely 22 people have received it since it was created 62 years ago. The Association Medal is bestowed upon an attorney or jurist who has made truly, and I quote, exceptional contributions to the honor and standing of the bar in this community. Past honorees include such giants of the New York Bar as Harrison Tweed, Orison Martin, Francis T. P. Plimpton, Cyrus Vance, Arthur Lyman, and most recently, Chief Judge Judith Kay, who is with us tonight. Tonight, it devolves upon Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, an extraordinarily qualified recipient. Everyone here knows the outline of Justice Ginsburg's magnificent career. After serving on both the Harvard and Columbia Law Reviews, she clerked for Judge Edmund Palmieri, one of the few federal judges at that time who encouraged and accepted women as clerks. She then entered the Legal Academy, first at Rutgers and then at Columbia Law School, where she was the first woman to be granted tenure. Forty years ago, Justice Ginsburg co-founded the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. From this post and as general counsel of the ACLU, she orchestrated a nationwide campaign to ensure that women enjoy equal citizenship under the law. In a series of cases before the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg argued that sex should join such protected classes as race and religion 
that benefit from heightened legal scrutiny. The Supreme Court agreed with her. In 1971, in Reed v. Reed, the court for the first time extended the Equal Protection Clause to laws that differentiated between women and men. Five years later, in Craig v. Boren, it held that the Equal Protection Clause demands that laws discriminating on the basis of gender withstand a heightened scrutiny standard. Put simply, Justice Ginsburg's time as a practicing lawyer fundamentally altered American law for the better, and we hope for all time. <laughs> On the high court since 1993, Justice Ginsburg has cemented her place in the American legal pantheon. In my brief allotted time here, I cannot begin to even limb the lengthy list of Justice Ginsburg's noteworthy opinions from her full 30 years of judicial service. I leave that to the numerous scholars and commentators who have and will undertake to analyze her body of work. United States against Miller, I'm sorry, United States against Virginia, Miller v. Albright, Gonzalez v. Carhart, Amchem Products v. Windsor, and Gasparini v. Center for Humanities, to name just a few, are testaments to her influence in equal protection as well as federal procedure, just two of the areas she has focused her thinking and her writing on. Beyond all of her judicial accomplishments, as you've heard from Carrie, Justice Ginsburg has been a steadfast supporter of the city bar. She's been active in committee work, she was a member of the, our executive committee from 74 to 78. And in recognition of her service at the city bar and her superlative groundbreaking career, the city bar did create these Ginsburg Lectures on Women and the Law in 2000. And indeed, you'll see Justice Ginsburg's portrait facing me right here in a place of honor. Quite simply, Justice Ginsburg exemplifies the enduring principles that underlay the creation of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, promoting reforms in the law and facilitating and improving the administration of justice. Martin Luther King famously said in a speech to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1967 that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends toward justice. But history does not arc of its own accord. There are women and men who spend their entire lives in struggle to bend that arc. Over her decades of practice and judicial service, Justice Ginsburg has been one of the foremost and most successful benders of that arc. She has succeeded in not only changing the law of gender equality, but changing the national conversation around it as well. When she began her career, it was legally and socially acceptable, even considered beneficial, to enact and enforce statutes that treated women and men differently for so-called benign reasons. As Justice Ginsburg herself set forth in her 1999 Cardozo lecture in this very room, the prevailing rationale at that time was, well, as she said, cosi fan tutte, women are like that. Justice Ginsburg's work revealed just how wrong those assumptions were and forced us all to drill down and ask a different, more transformative question. What kind of world do we want to leave for our daughters and granddaughters? for her unparalleled contributions to the development of the law and the protection of our fundamental liberties throughout her career as a practitioner, scholar, judge, and justice. It's my honor indeed to present the Association Medal to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg.
Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. The City Bar Association is first among the lawyers' associations in which I have participated. I joined in ancient days before there was a women's bathroom on the first floor, <laughs> and I remain a member to this day. I served first on the Foreign Law Committee from 1966 until 1969, then on the Post-Admissions Legal Education Committee from 1970 to 1974, on the Executive Committee from 1974 to 78. After that, the Sex and Law Committee, and just before I got my first good job in Washington, D.C., on the Civil Rights Committee. Affiliation with the City Bar has enriched and enhanced my lawyering and law teaching days. A reward enough, I would say. All the same, receipt of the City Bar's award is spirit lifting. I will keep it in chambers for all who visit to see. A thousand thanks for placing me in such illustrious company, including the company of my dear colleague, Chief Judge Judith Kay. Well, my main assignment tonight is to introduce our, our lecturer, the ever and most honorable Nancy Gertner. For 17 years, Judge Gertner was a federal district judge holding court in the District of Massachusetts. When she retired from judicial office in 2011, she became the Harvard Law School's professor, professor of practice. Growing up in Flushing, New York, Nancy was a girl for all seasons. She was a cheerleader, a writer for the school's literary magazine, and valedictorian of her graduating class. At first, her career path was straight as can be. All the right things appeared on her resume, an undergraduate degree from Barnard College, both master's and JD degrees from Yale University, a federal judicial clerkship with distinguished Seventh Circuit Judge Luther Swigert. What next? I can describe it best by borrowing Nancy Gertner's own words. I take them from the introduction to her illuminating, really hard to put down book published in 2011, In Defense of Women, Memoirs of an Unrepentant Advocate. Nancy recalled a public conversation at Yale Law School in which she and then Circuit Judge Sonia Sotomayor participated. Both responded to the question, how does one become a judge? Sonia answered, you graduate this fine institution with a stellar record. You work as a prosecutor in the celebrated Manhattan District Attorney's Office then as a corporate lawyer in a New York firm, you have clear principles, but you take care not to be publicly associated with controversial causes. You speak your mind carefully, cautiously, within existing institutions. You demonstrate in word and deed that you can be a neutral, temperate ju jurist. And then it was Nancy's turn. How does one become a judge? Yes, she agreed, you graduate this fine institution with a stellar record. But then you represent the first lesbian, feminist, radical, anti-Vietnam war activist accused of killing a police officer you can find. <laughs> That is your first major case in prime time. 
You then take every abortion case in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <laughs> you speak out on hot button legal issues at rallies on the Boston Common, on television, or in the editorial pages of newspapers. You represent defendants of all stripes, from those in political corruption cases to persons accused in high profile murder cases. And for the final coup de grace, you marry the legal director of the ACLU in Massachusetts, <laughs> John Reinstein, raising three children and sharing cooking responsibilities with him. In short, after doing everything that in this political culture should disqualify you from the position, you become a judge. And I might add, along with thousands of others, a great judge, too. Ardent advocate Gertner gained the highest recommendations of Senators Ted Kennedy and John Kerry, leading President Clinton to appoint her to the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts in 1994. Her approach to opinion writing follows a model I strive to employ as well. As Nancy put it, I always tried to write the first four paragraphs of my opinion in English. <laughs> I want my position to be as clear and as accessible as I can make it. Her most recent rave review, just last month, in an event for the bar and bench, aided by the Commonwealth Shakespeare Company, she starred in the role of Richard II. <laughs> when she retired from the bench in August 2011, a Boston Globe columnist wrote, Judge Gertner is many things to many people, unapologetic liberal, unrepentant advocate, civil libertarian of the highest order, and, may I say, a woman proud to call herself a feminist. But she's also something else, the Globe reporter wrote, something greater than the sum of these various parts. She is a voraciously fair judge who uses her love of the law and her sizable intellect to give refuge and recourse to those who need it. A colleague of a different political orientation, District of Massachusetts Chief Judge Mark Wolf, captured her spirit and significance best. She has a passionate devotion to justice, he said. We will be a grayer place without her. In her life's next chapter, I have no doubt that Nancy Gertner will brighten many stages as she continues to follow the biblical counsel, justice, justice shall thou pursue. She will thrive in that pursuit and legions will be the beneficiaries of her efforts. Nancy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a wonderful pleasure to be here and particularly to follow Justice Ginsburg. I have to admit, I have never uh, heard such an introduction before. I, I didn't, it didn't dawn on me that anyone would use my own book in that way. This is a daunting task. In part, it's daunting for the obvious reasons. Uh, the presence of an extraordinary woman in whose name this lecture uh, has been given. And it's daunting for the pedigree of the women who came before me in giving this lecture. But it's also daunting because of my memories. I was 30 years old. I was at a Women in the Law conference. The Women in the Law conferences began in the 70s with women law students, and the first one had the only woman lawyer any of us knew. We met every year, we traveled from law school to law school, and the numbers grew larger and larger as women's admissions to law schools grew larger. 
I had been a lawyer for only a few years. I sat in the front row of a large auditorium for the keynote address, and I listened with rapt attention to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, then head of the ACLU Women's Rights Project. She was, I thought, all I wanted to be, to devote one's life using these skills for civil rights, for women's rights, to be effective, to produce an extraordinary body of work, nothing could be better. And when then lawyer Ginsburg, what she was saying, spoke to me in a way that I hope her words will continue to speak to all of you. I identified very much with Justice Ginsburg, and while the years se separating us surely meant, uh, the years separating us to some degree meant that I didn't go through what she had gone through, but there were similarities. I have been told I can tell some of these stories. I've got permission to tell some of these stories. I'm incapable of delivering a lecture without telling stories. So we had some of the same background. When I got into Yale Law School, a moment of grand celebration, one would think. My mother told me, with all seriousness, Nance, you've just priced yourself out of the male market. When I marched against the war in Vietnam, I came home to Flushing, Queens. I had a fight with my father about what I had done. And at one point, he said to me, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he said, Nance, it's one thing to believe in something. It's quite another thing to do something about it. <laughs> and better yet, when I applied for a clerkship to Judge Swigert, uh, after you know three years of being a rather staunch feminist, uh, I sat down with the judge. The first word out of his mouth was, do you plan to marry and have children? <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Things were going through my head that I knew I shouldn't say. I knew I shouldn't walk out. And so I told him, no, Judge Swigert, I will never marry and have children. I swear to you, <laughs> I will never marry and have children, because at that moment, it was sort of true. Nearly 20 years later, the judge invited me to speak to this assembled group of law students and law clerks and his colleagues because he was about to retire. And I brought the man I was then living with, John Reinstein, with me. And we went to the front of the group. And I said to the judge, Judge Swigert, 20 years ago, you made me pledge that I would never marry and have children. I'm 39. Baron, release me from the pledge. <laughs> he had been a wonderful mentor. Uh, he understood. <laughs> and finally, when I graduated Yale Law School in a story that actually only a New York audience would understand. I've told this in Boston, and you know, there's sort of a titter in the room, but nobody understands it like a New York audience. When I graduated Yale Law School, I was about to clerk for a judge. I had all sorts of honors. One would think my life was secure. My mother and I had a gigantic fight, gigantic fight, the kind of fights that only mothers and daughters have. Women in the room, you know these fights. You say things to the woman you love that you would never say to any other human being in the galaxy. <laughs> what were we fighting about? Sadie wanted me to take the Triborough Bridge Toll Takers Test, just in case. <laughs> you never know. I told that story at my swearing in, and after I told the story, I said, excuse me, my mother is dead. I have to say something to her. I looked up at the ceiling. I said, Ma, at last, a government job. <laughs> I think I should sit down now. No. Um, but uh, so we have, a, we, we didn't, I can't say I had anyone encouraging me to do what I did. Uh, I can't say that this was the life's work that my parents spelled out for me. All I can say is that after my father died, by the side of his bed, I found every clipping that had ever mentioned my name over the previous years. Um, so I felt his support no matter what. It's a particularly wonderful time to honor Justice Ginsburg now. In addition to her extraordinary work on equal protection cases, I remember her work on the campaign to, for the Equal Rights Amendment. The ERA was introduced in much fanfare in 1970, just as I was graduating law school. It then sputtered for a host of reasons. What I most recall is the idiotic debate about the potty and the foxhole. <laughs> 
How are we going to have the ERA with the potty and the foxhole? That meant, were we going to have to provide bathrooms for women? And would women fight? Happily, we dealt with those issues. Yes, we had to provide bathrooms for women. Uh, and indeed, women could fight. Two weeks ago, we took the final steps to the ladder. The issue of who fights, like the issue of who governs, who judges, who presides, is or should be an issue of qualifications and not gender. Can you do the job, not who you are? But the larger story I want to tell is about two periods that define Justice Ginsburg's work, the period of advocacy and the period of judging. And although people don't write about this a great deal, how the former, the advocacy, uniquely equipped her for the bench. I labeled this talk a unique career and a unique voice. I want to address not just the familiar and somewhat tiresome question one would hope now, what difference does it make having women justices? But the difference this woman made, who had successfully litigated for women's rights as the founding director of the ACLU Women's Rights Project. How does one move from advocate to judge was a question I was asked constantly after my years as a civil rights litigator, as if advocacy was disqualifying rather than the opposite. Everyone moves to neutral on the bench. No one is born a neutral. Indeed, of those of us who have been advocates, we knew the differences between judging and advocacy clearly and explicitly. We knew the difference between our lives pre-judging and what, as Justice Ginsburg described, interstitial and incremental judging in a democracy required. We did not pretend that we ascended to the bench from obscurity, stripped down like a runner, as Justice Thomas once famously said. At the same time, context and experience matter. Understanding what access to justice requires, when it is stymied, and envisioning what it is like to be powerless, to represent the powerless, seeing the case before you and the implications in doctrine and in the real world. So first, the advocacy period. Uh, Judge Stein went through it a bit. I'll go through it a bit more. We celebrate the 40th anniversary of the founding of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, of which Justice Ginsburg was a co-founder. It is hard to describe her record before the Supreme Court in connection with the project. By the end of the 1970s, in part because of her efforts, the legal edifice of sex discrimination that we had been taught in law school had been dismantled. It was as if the men only or women only signs had been taken down across the country. And while the court was unwilling to treat gender classification as a suspect classification subject to strict scrutiny, as were racial classifications, the court had argued, had determined that it was subject to heightened scrutiny. To some feminist critics, this wasn't enough. Many were particularly critical of Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg's decision to bring cases on behalf of men. Rather than a brilliant strategy, these critics concluded that the emphasis had been entirely misplaced. The approach caused the court to adopt a narrow, sort of formalistic conception of equality that was incapable of rectifying discrimination against women. It was, they said, too assimilationist. It enabled women to get the same treatment as men insofar as they were prepared to act like men. But it hardly addressed the meaningful entrenched differences between men and women that derive from embedded cultural norms, a history of discrimination, and the social construction of physical differences. To me, an unabashed feminist, this criticism was simply nuts. It was critical to delegitimize sex-based legal categories wherever they were found, even as we recognized that real reform required more. But more recent scholars, like Harry Franklin, have finally recognized what then advocate Ginsburg was trying to do in bringing cases on behalf of women and men. It was more than just a good strategy. The goal, the goal was to deal with sex stereotyping directly, to place limits on the state's power to generalize about men and women, a goal that resonates today. I want to give you an example. In preparation for this talk, as I was snowed in in Boston, uh, I went through my papers, I went through my text, I had a fabulous time. 
I took out my dog-eared text, Sex-Based Discrimination, Davidson, Ginsburg, and K, 1974. You know this book. You buy it new, you crack open the cover, and it makes that unique sound. Those of you who are constantly on Kindles won't remember that sound. <laughs> uh, you write your name on the first page in a handwriting more perfect than you would ever use again. Uh, and that reflected how excited I was to get the book. And here's what Justice Ginsburg and her co-author said in 1974. The writings of Simone de Beauvoir, Betty Friedan, Germaine Greer, and others have described graphically some of the mechanisms that have tended to blind Western women to their possibilities. The cultural stereotypes reflected in the media, this is in 74, as mother, wife, girlfriend, nurse, helper, the symbolic identification of authority with maleness from deep resonant voices to patriarchal gods, the relative absence of working women as competent and successful role models. And then they added, less attention has been given to the situation of men. It's extraordinary to read this now. Despite the cultural bias in their favor, which assures them the greater share of power and prestige men are no less trapped in their assigned roles. Indeed, the very assurance of their dominance marks out for even greater social disapproval men whose unconventional interests and abilities lead them to choose different lifestyles. Only when men and women are able to see themselves and each other without preconceptions as human beings will the underlying support for sex-based discrimination disappear. It was an extraordinary statement. Members of both sexes needed to be available to participate in all social roles, to develop their individual talents. Her words echoed in me at that time, 1974, because I wanted to be everything. I wanted all of those roles, to be a lawyer, to be an advocate, to be a judge, to be a parent, to be a teacher. And as I stand here today, I want my sons and my stepdaughter to do so as well. Now again, while I want to start with the story of the advocacy, of Judge Ginsburg's advocacy, it's worth describing again because I wonder sometimes whether young women realize how recent this history is. So it's 1971. Reed v. Reed, as, just, as Judge Stein described, was the first case that the 14th Amendment was successfully invoked in a case involving gender discrimination, 1971. In 1973, in Frontiero versus Richardson, Ginsburg won on behalf of an Air Force officer and her husband who challenged a rule that allowed male servicemen to, get, uh, to claim his wife as a dependent, uh, whether or not she was actually dependent on him, but the reverse was not the case. A woman service woman needed to prove her husband's dependence on him. While attorney Ginsburg won, she could not win the strict scrutiny standard for gender discrimination. But what was wonderful about this body of law, and we used it over and over again, was the language that the court used for the very first time. The nation's laws were rooted in an attitude of romantic paternalism, which in practical effect put women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. 1974, the next year, she was before the Supreme Court again in Weinberger versus Weisenfeld, this time representing a man, challenged another two-tiered system in which Social Security survivor benefits were accorded to widowed, mo widowed mothers, but again, the widowed father uh, had to prove dependence. What was significant about this case was Mr. Weisenfeld wanted to care for the child, their child, after his wife had died in childbirth. And while Justice Ginsburg was not able then to get uh, even intermediate scrutiny, that battle was won in subsequent cases. 1977, I don't know what else she was doing with her life. Three years later, Califano versus Goldfarb. Gender-based discriminations, again, about Social Security survivor benefits, finding them to be based on archaic assumptions about women's dependency. It's hard to describe the significance of these cases because it was not just the holdings, but the language, which seemed to upend what we had been taught in law school. 
And finally, in 1979, two years before she became a district uh, DC Circuit judge, in Duran versus Missouri, the DC Circuit invalidated a jury selection statute that allowed women to opt out just by dint of their gender that then led to a number of cases making it clear what we take to be uh, incontestable today that women should serve on juries. And these cases don't begin to describe Lawyer Ginsburg's role in advising and supporting strategy uh, nationwide. My husband uh, worked with Justice Ginsburg on the veterans preference case which started in Massachusetts. The legislation had provided lifetime employment preferences for state government jobs to veterans. Life time preferences for veterans who are of course overwhelmingly male. The choice of men to litigate these cases in my judgment was not just strategic, although it was that. Again, it was part of a larger vision, uh, an extraordinary vision about freeing both men and women from the gender roles in which socialization had trapped them. And as Carrie Franklin described what was significant about these cases, these were gender bending, she described them as gender bending males. The man who wanted to uh, take care of his child, uh, the, the man who in fact was substantially supported by his wife. Then Advocate Ginsburg became a judge and then Justice Ginsburg. Justice who is a woman, a litigator, and our participant in law reform. Now let me frame for a moment what was going on in the 1980s when Judge Ginsburg began her work. To be sure, most categorical discrimination had been eliminated. The cases then and now shifted to be less about doctrine and more and more about proof. It was, as a student described to me, all about, and I love this concept, uh, chilling though it is, it was all about the opacity of discrimination. Discrimination was now opaque. You were turned down for a job not, as Judge Swigert had said to me quite explicitly, if he had turned me down, because of what I was or my gender, but you're turned down because of what is implied. And you, the young women of the 80s and the 90s, walk away from that interview thinking that it's you. And the courts, I might add, had, were becoming less and less helpful. In my new freedom as a, uh, to speak, no longer as a federal judge, um, I wrote an article which I called Loser's Rules. And I set out, it was really an article in which I tried to describe, which I'm trying to work on in other areas, the non-ideological pressures that I felt as a judge. The non-ideological pressures, not the pressures to go in one direction or the other. I was studying discrimination law since the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and what I found was troubling. Some 70% of civil rights cases, employment discrimination cases, fail on summary judgment. 86% of appellate opinions sustain the dismissal of these cases. And at a time when discrimination seemed to be more complex, more subtle, more opaque, case after case seemed to be ignoring or trivializing even evidence of explicit bias. To a degree that I have described in this article, again, now that I can speak, uh, as a virtual repeal, effected not by Congress, but by judges. It appears in these decisions that judges are looking for explicitly discriminatory policies and rogue actors and not finding them, dismissing the cases. It's as if the bench is saying discrimination is over, the market is bias free, the law's task is to find just the aberrant individual who didn't get the memo. The complex phenomenon which has, discrimination has become is reduced to this paradigm. Part of the reasons is what I called loser's rules. Uh, and it's an extraordinary pattern. When a defendant moves for summary judgment, the case is over. When a defendant successfully moves for summary judgment, rather, the case is over. The judge has to write a decision justifying the conclusion, right? The case is gone, you must write uh, an, an opinion. But when the plaintiff wins, summary judgment is denied, the case just moves on to trial. Every pressure that I felt as a district court judge was not to write a decision under those circumstances. Typically, all you do is write in the margin, denied. The result of this was what I came to see as a sort of asymmetric decision making. 
the evolution of a one-sided body of law as ever more cogent and compelling accounts of why the plaintiffs lost. Here you lose, here you lose, there you lose. But the problem was more than just the creation of one-sided precedent. The lens through which my colleagues began to view these cases changed. If case after case recites the facts that don't amount to discrimination, it is no surprise that the decision makers begin to have a hard time envisioning the facts that do amount to discrimination, or worse, come to believe that these claims are trivial. Doctrine becomes skewed. My favorite doctrine is stray remarks. In one case, uh, and I'm cleaning up the language, the decision maker says, damn women, I hate damn women in the office. This was, this was set aside by the judge as a stray remark, uh, not going to the real heart of the matter, uh, not something that should be considered in, the, lec in the, the calculus of discrimination. Losers' rules can frame a judge's view unless they have experience envisioning, imagining, or experiencing discrimination. Which brings me back to Justice Ginsburg. Who can envision discrimination? You can envision discrimination because you experienced it. Many have talked about women in judging, and it's an awkward topic. To admit the difference between men and women is to buy into the view or to run the risk of buying into the view that women's brains are somehow specially wired. But of course, one doesn't have to talk about it in those terms. One can speak about a woman as a judge in the same way Justice O'Connor spoke about Thurgood Marshall after his death. He brought to the Supreme Court conference table experiences that none of them had had about representing the reviled, about being subject to death threats in southern towns, about running out of town to avoid a lynching. We bring our experiences, our context, to the legal conference table as we do to all tables. Again, the Ginsburg, Davidson, and Kay book said as much. This, I was so stunned by what I read. Uh, in describing why there had been no gender discrimination case that was successful until 1971, two law professors are quoted in the book. Each of us is a middle-aged white male, they said. Some might characterize us, uh, characterize us as fairly typical wasps. Neither of us have ever been radicalized, brutalized, politicized, or otherwise leaned on by the establishment in any of the ways that in recent years have led many to adopt heretical views of various kind. Each of us was led last year, 1971, to investigate the ways in which American judges have responded to sex discrimination. And these two men, male professors, said, our conclusion, independently reached but completely shared, is that by and large the performance of American judges in the area of sex discrimination can be succinctly described as poor to abominable. With some notable exceptions, they fail to bring sex discrimination cases, those judicial virtues of detachment, reflection, and critical analysis. While judges have largely freed themselves from patterns of thought that can be stigmatized as racist, but sexism, making unjustified assumptions about individual capabilities, is as easily discernible in judicial opinions as racism ever was. You, Justice Ginsburg, have envisioned discrimination, and you've done so in your speaking dissents, the ones you've read in open court. Ledbetter versus Goodyear was a classic example. Pay discrimination case, the court held that Lily Ledbetter's claim was time barred because she had not filed her charge the year that she left the company, uh, rather than earlier on uh, when the pay differential was growing. Her pay differential was 40% lower than the men she worked with. The majority said that there was established precedent which holds that the limitations period runs from a specific act, discrete act of discrimination like termination, failure to promote, denial of a transfer, refusal to hire. Pay setting decisions were just another discrete act. As Linda Greenhouse noted in the, her wonderful lecture, the author of the opinion was Justice Alito, who she said, had only received government paychecks. And government employees are paid according to published schedules, 
Small wonder he assumed that Lily Ledbetter would have known what everyone was making. But as Justice Ginsburg wrote in dissent, again, capable of envisioning discrimination, the realities of, work, of the workplace with respect to pay put it in a different category than the public events of termination, failure to promote, or refusal to hire. Compensation disparities, in contrast, are often hidden from sight. In fact, if Ledbetter was getting regular pay raises, she would have assumed that she was in step with her colleagues rather than the opposite. You can envision discrimination when you have experienced it. You can envision discrimination when you have litigated it. How does one become a judge after having been an advocate? The law is not just words on paper. You understand the implications. When you've been a litigator, you profoundly understand what access to justice is, the law, the direction of the law, and how it translates into the world. Take Gonzalez versus Carhartt, which upheld the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act of 2003. Not just the outcome, put that aside for a moment. Justice Kennedy's decision presumes that while any abortion was an occasion for sorrow, quote, it is self-evident, he said, that a woman whose doctor performs her abortion by the method that the statute criminalized, he said it's self-evident that she must struggle with grief more anguished and sorrow more profound when she realizes what happened. Justice Ginsburg spoke in dissent, recognized the implications of these words and its tone far beyond the holding in the case. It was a patronizing assumption that reduces women to terminate, seeking to terminate pregnancy to a childlike state of ignorance. It was an assumption, a presumption, that we had heard before. In United States versus Virginia, you envisioned the implications of Virginia's failure to admit women to the all-male Virginia Military Institute because VMI had failed to provide the, quote, exceedingly persuasive justification for a scheme placing female cadets in separate but decidedly unequal girls' schools. Here again were the overbroad generalizations about ta talents and capacities that she had litigated for the 10 years from 71 to 1980. You envisioned these implications because you had litigated them. You came to the bench fully understanding the relationship between judging and the public discourse. When you wrote about too many dissents, that there would be too many dissents in an article during, that there could be too many dissents in an article while you were on the DC circuit, you said the rule of law, virtues of consistency, predictability, clarity, and stability may be slighted when a court routinely fails to act as a collegial body. But you knew the difference between those issues and the Carhartt decision and the Ledbetter dissent. Those were dissents that had to be made because the decisions of the majority went too far. You understood the relationship between judging and the political branches because you had litigated. In an article written while you were on the DC bench, you underscored the importance of a judge respecting the relationship with other branches. The court alone doesn't shape legal doctrine, but it participates in a dialogue with other organs of government. And so after the stinging Ledbetter dissent, Congress adopted the Lilly Ledbetter Act. And you fully appreciated your role as a your your role as a role model. I've always uh, disliked being asked to speak when I was a judge for only for one reason. Otherwise, as you can tell, I really love to speak all the time. <laughs> um, but it was as if I was trotted out as Exhibit A that the war is over. You're a woman judge. You're here. Need I say more? And of course, that was a big mistake. I always said more. Um, <laughs> as have you and Chief Justice Kay. No one gilded the lily, no one made the, fact, the facts look more optimistic than they were. Both of you have talked about the extent to which feminism has stalled. 50% of law school classes are female, have been such for nearly 30 years. The entry-level classes for firms is half female, 
Women account for 16% of equity partners, 26% of non-equity partners, 30% of counsel. While the numbers climbed in the 80s and 90s, the male to female ratio has leveled off. And these are not my words, these are actually from their writings. And the numbers have remained stagnant since 1992, just over 15% for the last 15 years. In one sense, law schools and, and the legal profession is a natural experiment. We have seen what happens when the numbers increase, when we re re achieved parity. And what we have seen is troubling. Why has progress stalled? Popular myths, one, my favorite one, was an article in the New York Times in August of 2003. Why don't women, more women get to the top? They choose not to. That the women's movement has only been about women's choices. The choice to be a mother or a worker, the women in this article stayed home to be with their children. In fact, this was not a choice. Social expectations, which we talked about in 1974, channeled them towards the home, and a less than family-friendly family workplace drove them from work. It was both the idyllic pull of motherhood on the one hand and the push of continuing obstacles in the workplace. I've written about that. The woman's movement that I participated in and that we participated in was about more than a woman's choice. It was about transformation. It was about releasing the potential for men and women. It was about revolutionizing the workplace with support services for families, altered expectations for both men and women, the gender-bending men that Justice Ginsburg represented. It was about transforming the, fa the family so that traditional roles would be shared. It was, in short, about what professor, advocate, Justice Ginsburg wrote about in 1974. Men are no less trapped in their assigned roles than women. We continue to struggle with gender stereotyping in the law, the maternal wall, the opacity of discrimination, sadly women's declining expectations about what they can achieve, and the inadequacy of the discrimination law to deal with them. Back in the 1970s, what Judge then Advocate Ginsburg said to me was prescient, spoke to me as a young lawyer with words that resonated now as much as it did then. So we need advocates on the bench, litigators, women, not because there's a one-to-one -one correlation between their advocacy and judging, indeed, not at all but because of their understanding of the context, the experience, the framework, the circumstances in which the decisions they make take place. Uh, I want to end with uh, something that Judge Daughtry said in a speech over 13 years ago. I love to end with my own unique way, but this was much better than anything I could do. This is Judge Daughtry gave uh, the Madison lecture 13 years ago. Uh, and she quoted an influential women activist of the 1970s, Jill Ruckelshaus, co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus. And here's what she said. We are in for a long, long haul. I'm asking for everything you have to give. We will never give up. You will lose your youth, your sleep, your arches, your patience, your sense of humor, and occasionally even the understanding and support of the people you love very much. In return, I have nothing to offer you but your pride in being a woman, all the dreams you've ever had for your daughters, and here I add, and for your sons, your future, and the certain knowledge that at the end of your days, you will be able to look back and say that once in your life you gave everything you had for justice. Justice Ginsburg, in all of the roles that you've played, role model, advocate, judge, justice, one thing is absolutely incontestable. You gave everything you had for justice. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Are you still okay with some yeah. Q&A? Thank you, Judge Gerder. That was obviously terrific. Uh, can't say more. And uh, again, Justice Ginsburg, congratulations. We do still have a uh, few more minutes at least, and uh, Judge Gertner has uh, graciously agreed to do some Q&A if people have questions for, uh, for her, which I'm assuming you do. So if, uh, if you do, please raise your hand. I will call on you and um, keep your questions short as you can, please. Um, and uh, we'll call you out, and we'll do the best we can with the timing. Yes. Try to get. Susan Herman, I'm president of the ACLU, and I'd like to give Justice Ginsburg a valentine in case you didn't know this. Judge Gertner referred to the fact that Secretary Panetta a couple of weeks ago ended the categorical exclusion of women in combat in the military. Most of the news reports did not mention that coincidentally enough, the ACLU Women's Rights Project fired a, filed a major lawsuit about this in November. <laughs> and all the plaintiffs that you've seen all over the television were our plaintiffs. And I think most of the news media did not point out that there might have been possibly some coincidence between the fact that we had this major lawsuit that they had to answer on that decision. So this is your work. That's not a question. No, it's okay. Anybody else? Please use the mic. Thank you very much for the lecture. It was awesome. Could you just tell us, you know, I just think being a judge is like the top of the career, and you gave it up. So what could you tell us a little bit about why you decided to leave the bench? Um, one was to speak. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was as simple as that. There were, I, 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 you know, anyone who knew my decisions and knew the articles that I wrote while I was a judge wonder exactly what I'm talking about, about not having been able to speak. <laughs> but, but I wanted to be able to step back and digest what I had seen. So the Loser's Rules article is about pressures and a pattern that really I'm not sure that anyone saw. And what I'm writing about now in, the, in my next book, which I'm trying hard to make funny, but being a judge doesn't get no way to make that funny, um, is about judging. Is about judging and frankly the extent to which it has nothing to do with the public debate about activism. Uh, it has more to do with the pressures to settle cases, to uh, accept pleas of guilty, to dismiss cases on technical grounds. Um, that's what I, and, and I couldn't write about that while I was on the bench. But I, I, it was not an easy decision. Others, here you go. There's no question that a law firms report that men will ask about family-friendly policies, but until it's, it, it is what Joan Williams describes as the maternal wall, and still it is still the case, it is still the case that the women who take advantage of those policies are stigmatized more than the men who take advantage of those uh, policies. So while yes, the, the next generation, the, the, you see a very different discussion, the structure of work still hasn't changed. And uh, I was really so struck by reading the commentary on, on Justice Ginsburg's work, and in particular, the, 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 the males that were selected as plaintiffs, 
for the males who were in some measure doing unconventional things. And until the workplace supports that, we won't, there, there won't be much of a difference. I think that it's a, it's a larger, it's also the 24 seven clock which makes it hard for anyone to be, uh, uh, have a family. And as long as those pressures, the traditional role still falls more on women than men, the 24 seven clock will have more of an impact uh, on women than men. I have to admit I'm doing some consulting on litigation and I love, uh, I, I was astonished at the email culture. Someone emails me on a Saturday and I look down and it begins, Ray, I have a thought. So I thought, okay. I, I, uh, I don't have to respond to that. And then I get a, uh, another email about two hours later. Did you get my first email? <laughs> F finally, I call him and I say, oh, you had a thought. I think all the time. <laughs> this is not an issue. But it's a very different, a very different litigation culture, which I think makes it harder uh, for, for women to have families and men. Welcome to private practice. <laughs> Other questions? Well, see, I, I don't, I'm not sure that that is in part a litigation issue, but not really. I mean, I think that it is an organization issue. I think that uh, women uh, and men need to uh, use the bully pulpit and organize. I think women in the firms have to compare stories. One of the things that I write about is the, the, the problem of declining expectations in this generation. I don't want to stigmatize young women, but uh, I worked when I was teaching at Yale Law School, which I did while I was judging, there was a report that came out uh, about the top 10 family-friendly firms. And they sent it to me because they want to show that they were doing something about this. I looked at the top 10 firms. And they were all firms that had 15, 16% women equity partners. So I wrote an article that was called The Revolution of Declining Expectations. And that's part of the issue. This is a, you begin to accept, because you don't no, no longer see formal inequality, the signs on the doors. You just begin to assume it's you. You don't connect with the woman next to you and you assume that nothing is gonna change. I never made that assumption, you shouldn't make that assumption if you don't begin to get together, organize, um, nothing will change. So. Well, you know, my, my own experience is not what I should be uh, uh, using to answer the question because my own experience is sitting there, right? I mean. Uh, John Reinstein and I met in connection with doing abortion cases. Um, and his first uh, comment to me before he walked into court was, you know, this is a woman's issue. There should be a woman's voice. Of course, he's regretted that comment ever, <laughs> ever since. But, um, uh, and we worked together. We too created, um, he loved to cook, I like to cook. We too created an environment where both of us could be litigators, but it shouldn't depend on whom you marry. We need to get back to a, an institutional discussion about what law firms can do, or even about, dare I say it, the government can do, social organizations can do, uh, because it just shouldn't be the happenstance of how much money you have or who you happen to, to marry. It, 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 this is an issue that crosses all lines. So yes, we worked out, a, you know, we, I, the problem with cooking is that I don't like the way he cooks and he doesn't like the way I cook, but <laughs> it's another issue. It's the only place we fight is in the kitchen. Anybody else? Um, I think we're On done. that note. That was, uh, <laughs> oh, wait, there's one over oh, there. A late breaking question. That's a, uh, an easy and a complicated question. The easy question is that everything short of reversing Roe v. Wade has been done. That to all intents and purposes, every regulation, however ridiculous, uh, 
has been upheld. One thing that we had in Massachusetts is that we litigated abortion rights in the state court. And one of the cases for which I am most proud is a case that situated the right to choose under the Massachusetts Constitution. So there will be no changes in our uh, state. Um, I think that that's very troubling. I think abortion access, quite apart from what the law is, has now uh, narrowed so substantially. The only thing I can say is that now that the debate has begun to include not just abortion, but birth control, perhaps people will wake up. Uh, it was one thing to talk to, to not understand the implications of making abortion illegal uh, today because birth control was so readily accessible. But if there begins to be a narrowing of the right to birth control, then I think all hell will break loose. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. It's thanks. been a terrific evening. And thanks again, Judge Gertner.